thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Rob Hedge. I work for Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service, a local government archaeology service in the West Midlands. Uh, this talk explores the intersections of archaeology, public memory and the construction of narrative. It takes up the story of Britain's most average place, the city in which I live and work. It's called Worcester. Uh, Reams have been written about what makes Worcester so average. Uh, every moment of national political turmoil brings flocks of journalists like disaster tourists eager to see what uh, politically important focus groups such as Worcester Woman, who won Tony Blair the 1997 election, make of what's going on in the country today. It is thoroughly average, it falls in the middle of absolutely everything. Demographics, uh, income, age, you name it, Worcester's bang in the middle. But have a look at this picture. It's lovely, isn't it? Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, you'll see it inverted in the final slide, uh, and it'll look very, very different. So if you have a hunt just below the G of Forgotten, there's a war memorial there quite an interesting one, Memorial to the Boer War. That shop you can see over there is a shop named Bygones. It takes beautiful things and sells you memories. Um, lovely, lovely things. And that roundabout in the middle uh, had some lovely trees on it. It's a very busy road. It's the sort of junction that takes all the traffic sort of heading from the motorway out towards Hereford. Uh, it's the second busiest road in the county uh, and that was a lovely floral roundabout and then two years ago I was involved in digging the whole thing up. Literally the whole thing, an archaeological excavation in the middle of a roundabout on the second busiest road in the county. Thankfully I wasn't running it. <laughs> My colleague who did, Richard, uh, gained many grey hairs in the process. I floated around the edge and uh, talked to lots of people about it, looked at the finds from it. I do a lot of public archaeology uh, and I'm also a find specialist. But to set this up, we'll move a few miles down the road to another town called Bromsgrove. Four years ago, this was an excavation on a, a site called the Market Hall in Bronzegrove. It was a kind of community excavation, but it was the first chance we had really to have a look at that part of Bronzegrove. Since then, we've done various more sort of development-led um, things on the site. A Market Hall was built there in 1994. At the uh, opening of the Market Hall, a time capsule was buried. Quote up there is from someone who witnessed it. We buried it over there in that planting box. I was stood here. See, you were stood around about where the sand pit was. I took some photographs. Wonderful. One of the aims of this excavation, in a kind of light-hearted kind of way, was to recover the time capsule. Only been buried 19 years previously. How hard could it possibly be? Until by the end of the first day of excavation, we had at least four different theories for the time capsule's location, and none of them proved accurate. I spent two weeks digging that sodding hole, and there is no time capsule anywhere near where anyone said it would be. The building, it was placed to mark, lasted less than two decades, and the capsule's position remains a mystery to this day. Miriam was talking about raw memories over a couple of decades. Well, a couple of decades in this case was enough to completely erase the memory of, of this town capsule. It doesn't seem to have dimmed the town's enthusiasm for time capsules. Uh, at least three have been planted in the last decade, um, indicating that there's nothing lacking in our pursuit of the creation of memory, even if we forget the specifics. This got me thinking, this whole uh, process, about approaches to memory which take a criminological slant. Uh, the reliability of memory, the reliability of witness. Now, despite an awful lot of good, solid theoretical work on memory, uh, people like Howard Williams, Yanis Hamalakis, so they, they've been many people exploring memory and archaeology over the last few years, we seem to be wedded to this, what 
I call this the storage model of memory history. And this quote up here is uh, from Mikhail Rolf Chloyo, um, a fantastic um, Haitian anthropologist who doesn't get read enough in this country. Absolutely extraordinary man who really understood the power of narrative and the power of silences. We'll come back to him a bit later. So he describes this storage model of memory history where memory are, memories are contents of a cabinet. Uh, but we tend to imagine that we go to a certain cabinet. We open a drawer, we extract a memory, which relates to a time and a place. We can do multiple ones and compare and contrast. But Troyo says the contents of our cabinet are neither fixed nor accessible at will. That model assumes, he says, not only the past to be remembered, but the collective subject that does the remembering. The constructed past itself is constitutive of the collectivity. In short, what that means, well, I think what he's trying to get at, is uh, that we're bad at remembering and bad at recognising that the collective reinforcement of memories of a past is a process rooted in the present. So I went looking at... Uh, Sort of psychologists and criminologists um, sort of views on this uh, and it's frankly terrifying uh, <laughs> the extent to which we're absolutely awful at remembering and, and, and perceiving things that go on in front of our face there's a, a, a quite scary um, paper there by Lacey and Stark in 2013 on the, on the reliability of witnesses in a courtroom some of you might remember about seven years ago there was an experiment done by uh, the police in conjunction with the BBC and the Open University where they uh, subjected a whole load of volunteers to uh, psychological uh, tests um, and put them through various sort of memory tests, uh, the volunteers all being under the impression that that was what they were signing up for. And partway through the research, to thank them, they took them all to a pub. Entirely staged scene. And over the course of about 20 minutes, there unfolded an argument and eventually a stabbing. And the entire thing had been set up. Um, and people who were yards away from it and very, very conscious, uh, since they'd been involved in these tests of memory, recollection, all of this, got it hopelessly wrong. Uh, one chap was, was standing a few metres away watching the entire thing unfold, got completely the wrong man. Uh, another witness described ha having seen nothing she said she didn't see anything whatsoever. But when they looked at the cameras and the eye tracking, she was watching the entire thing. There are, according to people who know more about these things than I, three stages in memory. There's the perception, what we see, what we hear, taste, touch, and smell. This in itself is a selective process. We can't be tuned to everything all the time. We can fail to encode detail or simply not notice stuff. There is storage. We know that we forget things over time, sure, but we also revise our memories and rewrite them to some extent. And then the third stage is retrieval. The brain is pulling out that information from those cabinets. All sorts of different areas of the brain are working together, and from that emerges a representation that is going to be your experience of a memory. Note that, an experience of a memory, not a memory itself. Every time you recall something, you reinterpret it all over again. And in every reconstruction process, errors and uh, variation is introduced. Okay. So how does this relate to what I've been doing? Um, I began looking at Paleolithic artefacts in the Midlands as part of a big project to look at all the stuff we've got that is mouldering in museum stores across the country. The Midlands, and the West Midlands in particular, is a no-man's land of Paleolithic archaeology. Nobody cares about it. It's not sexy. Uh, all the attention and the money goes on the south, the southeast, East Anglia. Fair enough, they've got some lovely stuff. But there's this story um, in the West Midlands that's intriguing. And the interpretation of it owes an awful lot to the capricious nature of archaeological memory. I started to think about how we map it. I was looking... <coughs> for a way to understand these artefacts in a way that fitted their landscape context. So I mentally went wandering off to the north, to archaeologists of the north, of the Arctic, to the outer margins of uh, human settlement, and in particular to the work of an ongoing project called Object Memories, um, and two scholars in particular, Peter's daughter and Olsen, who are taking a walk freeing theory from its anchors 
And it got me thinking about freeing it still further and drawing an analogy with a process integral to everything, but still, I think, poorly understood by us in our day-to-day -day work, to memory, and through memory, to forgetting. The current focus of Petzl's daughter Erin Alton is on drift, and especially the post-human journeys of human detritus as it washes up on the beaches of the far north. Uh, this is our somewhat less impressive and spectacular version, which occurs every time the River Severn floods around Worcester. These artifacts, rolled and battered, stripped of their cultural context, are in many ways analogous to the sea-worn plastics of Norway. Uh, hand axes that have been rolling around in a post-human landscape for millennia before they end up in a context from which they are recovered. And how must those artifacts have seemed to the people who encountered them in antiquity? To the early modern humans finding the final vestiges of Neanderthal culture on the slopes of Breeden Hill, south of Worcestershire. Petter's daughter in her work on Icelandic herring factories and other scholars of the north like uh, Barry Lopez here uh, have noted the way in which the aridity of a glacial environment and the slow rate of decomposition and soil formation seems to leave the promise of immediacy hanging in the Arctic air long after cultural echoes have faded like the odour of a ringed seal carcass after 800 years. We've said a lot of store, archaeologists, by Latour's immutable mobiles, something real transformed into something mobile and standardised, giving us power over artefact and knowledge. We map artefacts, we gain power over their interpretation. The immutable, the geological, becomes mobile through the medium of print and fixed in the process. But this is nonsense. These dots... These artefacts are separated by at least 5,000 generations. How can they form dots on the same map? Speciations apart. And the maps are ever incomplete. We drift, we forget, we lose artefacts, we lose labels, stories bend, and memories are fluid. What I like about the approach of Petters, Dotter, and Olsen is that they highlight this disconnect between the wild, scattered, and incomplete nature of archaeological things and the expected coherency and wholeness and logic of theory. They invert that immutable mobile into a mutable mobile, oblique, unfinished, partial, and provisional. Uh, this is a lump of slag in a museum. It's a Roman road fashioned from slag, and this, as far as I could tell, after months of hunting around, is the excavation of said lump of slag. This was part of a development in the 1980s that swept away a 1960s shopping centre, but it in itself has been forgotten, unpublished, for all sorts of reasons. There are many reasons sites remain unpublished, but this is an artifact that seems almost to be moving towards the post-human. It appears to be losing its identity and developing an identity all of its own. Uh, to collapse that symmetrical archaeological vision for a moment, I do still have power over that artifact, the power to decide whether it stays or whether it ends up in a skip. That one, we decided, is staying. We forget, but in the forgetting we reforge narratives, stories collide, and objects gather and fade like drift on a beach. And so, to the modern, at least to the 1940s, this is an uh, image from the 1946 development plan of Worcester. And what's fascinating about this image is that it was a plan that would have swept away the entire medieval heart of the city. Now, Troyo says power relations enter at each of the junctures, the making of sources, archives, narratives, and significance, rendering certain facts more real, recoverable, or memorable than others. This plan was never followed, but it exists. It is published. You can go to the local library. It is in a book. It holds sway over the more nuanced, piecemeal, and somewhat chaotic reality. It has not been forgotten by generations of residents. Here is an interesting example of landscapes forgotten. The last medieval cathedral lichgate in Europe, demolished in the 1950s. A scar on the collective memory of the residents of Worcester. What was really interesting to me when I stood up in the street doing all sorts of sort of ad hoc bits and pieces, a lecture on Worcester porcelain factory here, a lecture on um, 
uh, yeah, the Roman origins of the high street there, trying in many ways around our limited little hole on the roundabout to weave stories about what was going on. What I had was an endless stream of people coming up to me and saying, in some cases standing on the excavated remains of the street itself and telling me it wasn't here, it was over there. I said, you're standing on it, mate. But many people remembered what wasn't there, and this memory of absence comes alongside the forgetting of place and the construction of a, a narrative that is idealised. Although the buildings were derelict and they remembered cockroaches in the houses, they felt there was a sense of community. Lovely. I started talking to people about the fact that this latest sweeping away of the medieval street was only the latest in a long line of sweeping aways. Uh, I talked to them about how the cellars of that medieval street were constructed on remnants of the Civil War wall and remnants of the robbed out priory. You can see that lovely piece of um, window uh, vault or vault rib um, there in the photo. As a recapitulation, many of Lich Street's structures were built or extended using robbed remains of earlier ones. Rip it down and flog it off, don't suppose we were any different back then. The cat badge was a lovely one, because that was sort of placed in a niche in the wall and recovered when one of my colleagues was cleaning its wall, and it just popped out. Such a human thing to do, isn't it? To push it into a niche and forget about it. A tiny act of forgetting contained within a whole forgotten street. And to finish, we come back to that scene from the other way round. There's bygones, that shop. This is a couple of years later, the roundabout has vanished. Excavated it, done. Whole new public square, 1960s shopping centre being refaced, 1960s travel lodge not being refaced, unfortunately. There's the war memorial, and here in front of it, this is taken just before the general election earlier this year, in a piece on exactly how average Worcester is, and that line of police officers there. Uh, they're actually, they were, they were going through the city training police dogs. Um, uh, a lot of counter-terrorism work going on in the lead up to the general election, a lot of fears of uh, unrest. But it takes that familiar scene and twists it around. It fragments, it's inconsistent, they're entangled. Those are the nuances that constitute our craft, say Petter's daughter and Olsen. We should approach memory as we do things and as we do theory, with an understanding that all are defined by what they owe and how they lend. I find that approach a powerful one, and I extend the metaphor. Let us approach theory as we retrieve memory, not as a store from which meaning is to be plucked at will, but rather as a recipe, adaptable to the conditions. Substitute memory for theory, in a lot of their work, and the analogy works beautifully. Fragility and weakness is what keeps theory alive. And what is theory but the application of a remembered framework, the loading of new experience with a model for explaining it? They say theory is adrift. Theory is a nomad in a mixed world. Well, so is memory. Always accommodating themselves to shifting local conditions. And as with theory, so for memory, Petter's daughter and Olsen say it matters what they matter for, it matters what things they bump into, what networks and meshworks they become entangled in. We forget, we reconstruct, and every story is incomplete. Every narrative is a bundle of silences, but the more stories we endeavour to tell, the less likely we are to forget. And I, like Katharina, call for a return to storytelling. But I leave you with this thought. Sometimes the absence, the forgetting, can be more instructive than the discovery. However far we lurch towards the post-human, we are still concerned with people. And I think that the failure to find that Bromsgrove times capsule tells us more about the human condition than finding it ever would. Thank you.